I think I'm just going to, um, the numbers are, people are still trickling in. Um, so I might just give it one minute. It is only, it is a one hour um, session and um, we've got a lot to get through because uh, we've got quite a few speakers and I'm sure there'll be some, some questions as well. So I, um, I just want to start on uh, by saying on behalf of Pennington Institute that I, I respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of, of all the lands uh, which we are uh, on today and we're joining for this this session and that I'm I'm speaking I'm speaking from the land of the, the Boon um, Wurrung and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and I pay my respects to the elders past present and, and emerging so um, many of you, perhaps most of you, uh, know about Pennington Institute. Uh, we're an NGO and we work to provide um, or really to, to enhance um, uh, the evidence, I guess, to, that's needed uh, to help us all rethink drug use and to create change for, um, for the better. We, we do that through, um, through a number of ways, and that's through research, it's through policy, and, and it's through frontline workforce education and, uh, and public awareness campaigns. And, and today is an example of that. So what we're doing today is we are all, we're joining here um, in regard to uh, a training a session around GHB. It's, it's, a, it's a topic that has been getting a lot of attention uh, and uh, there's, been a, yeah, there's been a lot of discussion about that. So it's a time to be doing a lot more um, training and, and raising awareness about that. And we've got, we've got four speakers today. Uh, we've got, uh, and what we're doing is we're gonna bring all those speakers together at the end and we will have a, have a panel discussion. So that will be the time for everyone um, to be asking questions, and can I ask? Can I ask people um, with their questions if you could, um, throughout the session, if you just pop them in the, the chat, and we, I will do my very best um, to to sift through those questions and make sure that um, we ask those questions of the of the panel, um, uh, which we're hoping to have about fifteen minutes at the end to have those those discussions. So it should be a good a good opportunity. So. Um, there is also uh, a, there'll be a link in the um, in the chat, which is a, a very short uh, questionnaire survey. Just if you don't mind taking um, taking that up and having a look at that, it's uh, it's about five questions, just so we can get some feedback from from the session, which would be which would be great. Okay, um, so I think that's the main things. What I want to do now is I want to introduce to you uh, the first speaker. The first speaker is Lily Owen. Lily is the Community uh, Health and Safety Officer at Pennington Institute. Lily's been with us for, for most, of, most of this year. And, and Lily's responsible for, um, or one of the things that she is responsible for is, is providing training and support to um, the Victorian New and Syringe programs and, and other organisations in the ARD sector. So Lily, um, Lily's passionate about drawing on her lived experience, and we're going to be hearing a bit of that that today, and and that's that's to educate the community about the reality of addiction, while also rethinking ways Australia currently tackles harm reduction, treatment, and and recovery. And there she is up on the screen. Um, so thanks, Lee. I'll I'll um, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Stephen, um, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, over this Zoom platform. It's awesome to see how many people need to learn about GHB. Um, and as Stephen mentioned, I've got uh, lived experience with GHB and have seen it as a problem for me and my peers um, for many, many years now. So yeah, I know the drug very well and I um, yeah, feel very blessed to be sitting here and able to sort of draw on um, the evidence and all these other amazing speakers and to be able to um, help you understand the effects and risks of GHB use and figure out ways and equip you with strategies to promote safer using. So let's get started. So today um, we're going to go through the effects of GHB, how and why people use GHB, reducing risks, uh, what to do if someone's overdosing, what the signs are of an overdose. Um, dependency and withdrawal. And then we've got Sandra Hocking from Windana speaking about um, the pre uh, managing presentations of GHB. 
in treatment. And then we've got um, Marla Van Reest, all the way from the Netherlands, um, who's formerly from harm reduction, so um, from Dance Live. So we'll be speaking about stigma and GHB and stimulant use and other drug use. And then we've got Simon Brisbane from Uniting Ballarat to speak about experiences from the front line. So it'll be a great session. Um, so by the end of this session, you should understand the effects of GHB and why people use it. And then to be able to offer your clients and mates suggestions for safer using. Uh, able to recognise a GHB overdose and know how to respond best and understand dependency, withdrawal and treatment for GHB. And then understanding ways to minimise stigma when working with people with GHB. So GHB is actually, it's, I was speaking to a mate the other day and GHB is something that hasn't been around for years. He's still using on ground and it's, it's the umbrella term is GHB and what happens is there's GBL and 1,4-BD that they're chemically similar and when they are consumed, they convert to GHB in the body through the liver. So for 1,4-BD, there's a two-step process in the liver. It's, um, it's an in industrial solvent. It's easier to access. It's um, a cleaning product in a variety of industries and it's got a longer duration than GHB, um, than GHB and GBL. So GBL is more potent and it's a shorter duration, but on the, you'll be, the overdoses that are presenting um, tend to be the 1,4-BD and the, and the GBL. Um, so I'm just going to call it GHB. It's, it's, it's a central um, nervous system depressant drug. So it slows down the heart and the breathing. Um, it's taken orally. It's colourless, odourless, slightly oily and clear to semi-opaque. And it, when pure for the 1,4 BD, it can freeze it under um, a particular degrees. And then it's got a really strong and distinctively chemical taste that's often described as salty, soapy or bitter. So GHB, I mean, it's, it's one of these drugs that's been known to be used at festivals and dance parties and clubs, but um, we've seen uh, you know, all the presentations during COVID, there's been an increase of, um, of GHB overdoses. So it is used alone, um, definitely used alone, and it's used in conjunction with other drugs, especially um, methamphetamines, big one that it's used um, in conjunction with. So it's also, uh, it enhances people's sex drive and um, and promotes that sort of sexual confidence as well. So it's, it's used a lot at um, private sex parties and during sex. Um, but yeah, definitely it's a, a problem at festivals and nightclubs. I mean, I saw, I went to a festival, or this is when I first saw GHB was probably 12, 12 years ago. Um, and I remember going to this festival and just at the end of it, seeing just bodies on the ground, just so many. I think it, it was, it just become really popular. And um, just, it looked like people were almost a sea of dead, dead people, really frightening. It's, it's such a hard drug to, um, to monitor, you know? So it is just, it has, it, it can never really, there are safer ways of using it, but it is, it's a very unsafe drug. And so when it's, um, you know, first brought into sort of peer groups, that's where um, the education really needs to start. So why do people use GHB? So it is, it's a sedative, it's a depressant, it makes you feel relaxed, it reduces anxiety. Um, you know, a lot of people who have, um, who use drugs are, are using it to um, reduce that anxiety or other sort of um, mental health issues. But the main thing is, is it's, it's something that makes you feel happy and it makes you feel, it increases euphoria, it reduces inhibitions um, and it increases sociability. Um, my friend, he's in recovery now, but he was a very heavy GHB user. And I said, why, how and why did it become such a daily 
ongoing thing for so long. And he said, it made me the person that I wanted to be. It made me that confident person that people responded to and that people wanted me to be. You know, people respond to confidence and charisma. And, um, and it, you know, it just, it gave him that thing that he had always been seeking for his whole life, that, that, that you know, lust for life and alluring, you know, character that he wanted. And, you know, when you're using, you think the after effects are minimal. You don't really think, you think there's no come down because it's the, it's the short acting drug. Um, it's often said um, that it's uh, liquid ecstasy. So it's, but it's a cheaper alternative to say the, to MDM, MDMA and it's easier to access rather than MDMA. And it is because it, um, it's locally sourced, locally manufactured and, it's yeah it's a it's a very easy drug to access it's a very cheap drug to access you know a dose um this is only from like the last time i was using which was years ago but about three or four years ago it was just a few dollars to have one dose so and that and that's gonna you know be like uh you know a good hit of say mdma which will be much more expensive so that's why it's definitely used in a party scene. Um, so as I mentioned, it minimises anxiety and it's easier than, say, getting Valium or Xanax. And it's not detectable in roadside tests. So as I mentioned, it makes you feel happy and relaxed. It increases your sex drive um, and enhances sociability. So, but at high doses, as we've seen, um, and what's been presenting in hospitals and admissions to um, to other detoxes, it can include unconsciousness and death. So it does, it is addictive. Um, this is something I didn't know. <laughs> I mean, every drug is addictive, but didn't realise how much, um, how the physical dependency could develop so quickly. It's within one to two weeks it can happen. And withdrawal is really dangerous and it can, um, and it has to be managed in a hospital setting. So in terms of the common effects, there's, there's that increased appreciation of everything. So if you're in the dance setting, it's gonna be music and dancing and talking and sociability. Um, it's increased sexual desire, it's sexually stimulating. Everything's more attractive, other people are more attractive, you feel more attractive. Um, and you've got the, look, the mood lift, the euphoria and the relaxation. So physically, you're going to have a slurring of speech, decreased motor skills and lack of coordination. If you, see, if you know, um, you know, you might have clients or know people who present using um, methamphetamine. So there's that, that sort of tonic twitching and, and that involuntary twitches and repetitive motions or actions. There's, got, there's a very similar... Um, thing when you're on GHB, it's sort of a very jolty movement in the body. Um, and there, it will create that sleepiness and the grogginess. Depressed breathing and other effects that feel quite similar to um, being intoxicated with alcohol. So you can have a regular shallow breathing and um, blackouts and memory loss and sweating. So also includes nausea and vomiting and unconsciousness, which is it's a blowout. Um, it's that can last for three to four hours. Uh, urinary incontinence, diarrhea, headaches, dizziness, and ringing in the ears. And then um, also there's that physical dependency and the withdrawal symptoms, depending on the strength of the dose and depending on the GBL or the wonderful BD. Um, the withdrawal symptoms can be quite intense um, and apparent within one to six hours of the dose. So you can have that anxiety and that paranoia will kick back in and be heightened and psychosis as it leaves the system and also seizures and death. So surprisingly, there is not much known about the long-term effects of GHB in humans. So um, Scientists have discovered that the party drug GHB can cause changes in the brain over time. And that could possibly be because of the um, lack of oxygen when there is that GHB blowout or overdose, when 
the you know respiratory system slows down there's a lack of oxygen to the brain so that could lead to memory memory problems reductions in iq and increases in stress and anxiety so this conclusion isn't um, definitive because it's it's a it's a very hard drug to test especially because it's used so frequently with so many other drugs especially methamphetamine we know that the long well the long-term effects of methamphetamine use are those um you know increased mood disorders um and memory problems and increased stress and anxiety long term so really um this is a really good sort of way to i want to talk about reducing risks and administration is the best way to sort of pass on to your clients there's going to be a range of people here so either to your mates or your clients or to yourself whoever it might be it's just about spreading these messages um it's you know i i always thought that i used responsibly and i thought and uh, um, myself and my friends thought we used really responsibly but there'd always be someone who blew out always whenever we were using not if not one two three it was just it's one of these drugs that it is so different each batch you're getting is so different the potency changes um so much it depends on different body weights which we'll get into but it's really important to uh, to use um a syringe barrel without a needle so that you can measure it to the um, 0.1 of the dose so 0.1 mil of a dose. So never use those um, soy sauce fish bottles. I never really saw them or use them. It, we were very, very, very precise with what amount we were using. So you can get these from your pharmacy, um, from behind the counter or from your local needle exchange. And also during COVID, we've got to be safe and don't share your plunger and don't ever drink out of um, a cup or bottles, um, if you're going to put it in, in a bottle, uh, maybe put some food colouring in so that you know that it's GHB rather than water. There's always those horror stories at festivals of people just drinking straight out of the bottle thinking that that person's carrying water. Um, stay in control of the amount you're taking and don't ever let anyone else measure it out for you. Always really, if you're using it in conjunction with, say, a partner during... Um, you know, at home or during, you know, a sex party or having sex with someone else, a, a lot of the time people want to um, control, not want to, but there, there does seem to be that thing, especially if you're new to using GHB, people will control the, you know, the amount you're taking, but only you know how you're feeling and it is different from each person. You cannot take the same amount as the other person or as your mate or a girl your same size totally dependent on the time of the month, what you've eaten, um, a whole myriad of factors. So also never use alone ever. Um, it's one of those things that you can, it's that depressed breathing and there's that um, high chance of, you know, choking on your vomit if you're, if you're alone. Always tell your friends when and how much you're taking and write the time and the dose to the mill on your arm. Um, another way of doing that is putting a timer on your phone. So that's important. So always start low and go slow. So just two drops can be the difference between having fun and then having a blowout on GHB. So as I mentioned, everyone's, um, everyone's different. Every batch varies. Uh, it's, it's very common for, you know, someone to try a bit, from someone else's bottle and use the same amount. You know, people normally have their doses that are um, that work for them. Um, it's it's really really easy to overdose on GHB, um, and yeah, because the, the quantities are just measured in such small doses and small quantities. So this is what I'm most passionate about is mixing drugs and alcohol with, um, with GHB. So Marla's going to be speaking more about it and the, and the, um, the risks, but it just is something that you just don't, it's not even 
worth doing. I, so as I mentioned before, I always thought that I was very um, responsible with my, with my drug taking and GHB, um, GHB taking. So I um, would or never drink when using GHB or always keep it hours apart. And my friends that I was using with were the same, so they'd always be checking and monitoring. So one night I'd gone out for a couple of glasses of wine, then that led to going to someone else's house. And then I waited a few hours and then took some GHB and then nothing worked. Waited a few more hours, took GHB, nothing worked. Um, and thought, oh, that's, that's strange. Anyway, it ended up being a sort of all nighter thing. And I went for an early lunch with my family and must have been like an 11 30 12 o'clock lunch had a glass of wine the last thing I remember is walking down the street with my little brother and then waking up in the St Vincent, in St Vincent's hospital at six about five or six p.m with nurses shaking me and my mom and my brother around me saying what what have you taken what have you taken and is that I, I was out, I was out. And the only thing I can put that down to is that that night earlier, previously, I had been drinking and then taking the GHB, but the presence of the, like the alcohol was being, um, and this is just not from a scientific, like, but it gets processed in the liver at the same time. So the drinking, the alcohol was being um, metabolized in my liver GHB was sort of staying on top of the alcohol and not being metabolized. And then as soon as I had a, um, had a drink, I was out. And it was, it was obviously definitely the doses of GHB that hadn't been processed yet. So that, you know, I thought I was being safe in terms of ridiculous drug use, but it was, that's the, you know, what I thought it was safe. Um, and a, a terrible outcome, you know, a really terrible outcome that's just unfortunately all too common. Um, I'd say, you know, my friends in total, the amount of times people have been rushed to hospital or not rushed to hospital, not enough people have been, um, you know, we never called triple zero. We thought a blowout wasn't an overdose, but it is, you know, so it is that mixing of drugs, never mix GHB and alcohol, just it's not worth it. It's just, if you do GHB, you just do GHB. It's not, it's just, it's not worth it. You can't control it. Um, even if you think you're being in control. Um, once, so combining GHB with other depressants like opioids or benzos or ketamine or nitrous oxide is really dangerous as well. Um, so it's that depressant on a depressant. So it can um, be fatal and can decrease the heart rate and breathing. And then combining GHB with uh, methamphetamine, ice or other stimulants like cocaine or MDMA can be really dangerous and fatal and place the heart under a lot of strain. So within 10 minutes, the effects are usually felt. So, um, and about 10, yeah, 10 to 30 minutes, it's, um, it's felt and then it peaks somewhere between 45 to 90 minutes. So this, this 90, between 10 and 90 minutes is the, it's, it's quite the danger zone because at 90 minutes, you feel like most of the effects have worn off, but you've still got it. It's still active in your system. And this is where you'll sort of redose. Um, and yeah, so five hours, it's still in your system. And remember this, if you're use, planning to use other drugs, and then 12 hours after the after effects and grogginess and sleepiness can be felt. So again, the onset, um, it completely differentiates from person to person and it's a range of factors. So sex, weight, and um, how recently and how much you have eaten. So again, to re really reiterate such a thin line between a fun time and an overdose. So when you're overdosing, someone might feel grogginess, nodding in and out of uh, consciousness, dizziness, disorientation, might be irritation and agitation, vomiting, um, convulsions, and then that irregular shallow breathing and potentially depressed breathing. So really important if someone has flown out, overdosed, 
put someone on the side because we really need to avoid um, that inhalation of vomit, which can potentially cause fatal choking. So put someone in the recovery position on their side and um, call for help and make sure you check their breathing until help arrives. So if someone's still conscious or able to be woken and is responding to their name, keep them, keep them awake and seated on the floor. Um, if you are comfortable, sit behind them, brace their shoulders and keep, keep them responsive by asking them questions at a loud volume. If they're not responding to that, try doing something physically, getting some physical sort of reaction through pinching their shoulders, rubbing the sternum, pinching the fingertips. But the best one is sort of um, grabbing their shoulder. Um, so again, it, that, it, that person can have that sudden jerking, tonic, rigid movements. And assessing what they're doing in response to your loud voice, make sure that they remain responsive to you. But if someone isn't responding to that, not responding to pain, not responding to voice, put them in the recovery position, call triple zero, ensure they're breathing and continue to check on their breathing until they wake up. And um, people will usually wake up after three to four hours. So thank you. Back to Stephen. There I am, back again. Thanks, Lily. That was great. That was great. That was a, um, covered a lot. Um, I'm going to um, quickly jump jump in now to introduce um, Sandra, Sandra Hocking, and it's great, Sandra. Thank you uh, for being part of this. Uh, Sandra is uh, is the manager of withdrawal and coordinated care at uh, Wigiana. There she is. G'day. Um, Sandra is a registered nurse um, for over 25 years experience in, in alcohol and drug sector. Uh, she's a master's in mental health and a graduate diploma in addiction and a graduate diploma in health services management. And she's the program manager for um, uh, the withdrawal program at Windana, which includes an adult residential unit in St Kilda and a youth residential unit in Dandenong. Um, and non-residential nursing teams located in Dandenong, Frankston and Geelong and a harm reduction program, a dual diagnosis program. So that's, that's, a, that's a lot. And um, Sandy, you're gonna, be, you're gonna be sharing with us um, uh, your insights and experience around, um, around treating, I guess, and what you've, what you've, um, what you've learned from, from the front line. So thank you very much. Thanks, Stephen. And um, <clears throat> forgive me, everyone, if my voice is a bit croaky. I inhaled a bit of tinsel this morning, and I think I'm coming down with some tinselitis. <clears throat> so um, anyway, that's just uh, to get you through towards Christmas. A little bit of humour always helps in uh, such a serious topic. Um, I can see all the ha-ha dad joke comments coming through. Um, all right, well, look, um, good run through this pretty quickly because we've got some other speakers, but um, as uh, Lily said, and um, uh, GHB is something that it's, it's a bit hidden in our drug stats. Um, when I looked at our um, stats for the sort of people that we see here, as you can see from that graph, only 1% of all the people we treat uh, record or, or nominate GHB as their primary drug. But what, what in fact occurs, um, is they're using the drug with other things, with the, the methamphetamines, with the alcohol, with the cannabis. And so if you go to the next slide, Lily, thanks. Um, so when I dug a bit deeper into the stats, um, and I think other agencies would find a similar thing, where we're seeing that 6% record GHB as their secondary drug um, in the last financial year. And in this year to date, that's, that's sort of gone up to 7% so far. So it'll be interesting to see how the year pans out because anecdotally, we do feel like we're seeing a bit more of GHB. Um, our stats, um, although they are quite low, um, I'd like to just leave you with that point that data is only good if it's there and if people, and this has caused us to look a little bit at our data entry and to sort of realise that people aren't really entering a secondary drug as often as maybe they could. Um, 
Okay, so just going to the next slide. Thanks, Lily. Lily's been my driver this morning, so I sort of feel like uh, I'm out of control here. Um, so the most important thing we like we need to do in the detox environment is assess the risk. So we're really lucky here in Victoria. We've got we've got a whole range of um, detoxes that range from really you know beds in hospitals. Uh, to other units that are associated with hospitals or closely located um, to units such as the Windana unit, that's, that's much more community uh, focused and much more like a home environment. So that's, um, so the, for the, the consumer, there's a great choice. Um, but what we're trying to do, um, you know, safety is the key. And what we're all trying to do here when um, people present for GHB with withdrawal is we're trying to assess which is the safest place for this person to be. Um, the guidelines, they, they're a bit vague in terms of, um, you know, they range from, you know, some say the South Australian guidelines say that um, pretty much under four mils, you can safely detox at home but over 30 mils, you'll, you'll really suffer and you need to go to um, uh, an inpatient unit. Um, here at Windana, we sort of sit around the, we, we kind of say, look, you know, we think we can manage around 20 mils or less, preferably less, but, um, but it, you know, it's, we've got to take so much into account. One of the key things to take into account is the frequency of use, because that's the thing that really gives us an idea of how dependent someone is. If you've got, um, you know, someone might go out and just um, have a binge once, once a week, once a fortnight and use 20 mils, and then they don't touch it again for a week or a month or whatever. Um, and they might have a few, you know, blowouts as Lily referred to. Um, but the, those people that are using 24 seven, including overnight, even if they're little increments, even if they're tiny little amounts, um, that, that sort of indicates to us that they're gonna suffer a little bit more in withdrawal and need um, a more um, you know, supervision. If you've been someone, I noticed on the comments asked, how long does it take to get dependent? It, it happens really quickly. So if you're using every day for more than two or three weeks, um, you really got to uh, stop and think that, that you know, you're, you're probably uh, entering into that dependency zone. Um, the other indicator, when you go without a, a dose of it, um, you start to experience some of these withdrawal symptoms. Um, take us to the next slide. Thanks, Lily. And the withdrawal symptoms that, you know, we are talking about, and I think probably the first one is that insomnia that, um, you know, waking at night, not being able to get to sleep, um, and then, you know, which often leads to people using overnight um, to try and re, you know, adjust their system. Um, you know, feeling anxious, restlessness, you know, having a mild tremor, sweaty, tachycardia, which is, you know, the fast pulse, high blood pressure, you know, leading into, you know, the nausea, the vomiting. I mean, we're getting into the sort of more serious withdrawal symptoms now hallucinations, delusions, paranoia, and of course, what we want to all avoid is the delirium and the seizures that are extremely dangerous. Um, over to the next slide. Thanks, Lily. Um, so how we manage um, GHB withdrawal um, is we, we treat it as for alcohol withdrawal. Basically, um, it's, you know, this, as Lily mentioned, you know, GHB acts at the same receptor um, as alcohol. And so, um, you know, it has a similar sort of withdrawal um, picture. Probably it happens, uh, people go into withdrawal a lot more quickly than they do with alcohol. And then it's compared with a benzo withdrawal, it's, it's protracted like a benzo withdrawal might be. Um, so the approach is to use an alcohol withdrawal scale, which measures those symptoms, which I was just talking about before, the tremor, the sweats, all that sort of thing. Um, you want to do an early loading of a GABA receptor agonist, such as diazepam. That's pretty much the drug that's mainly used. Some units will throw in a, um, some baclofen, um, a few doses of that a few times a day. That's um, That's got some effect, but there's not a lot of um, good research behind that as yet. We just don't have um, the information on that. And other people also throw in some antipsychotics sometimes. But yet again, we really don't have the research there to say this is a really good drug to use in this environment. Um, 
and you know we don't have the research because we haven't done the randomized controlled trials um, so what we want to do is we want to achieve sedation we want to you know sedate the person get them comfortable but we want them to still remain rousable we don't want to like bomb them out completely of course um, and then close observation we want to be observing for signs that they're deteriorating um, if we you know if you notice any increased agitation confusion they're unable to settle they're getting up all the time walking around um, you know you need to really take stock and, and reassess the situation and obviously keep doing measuring their symptoms using that alcohol withdrawal scale um, tool um, if they're you know unable to take oral medications or fluids you know that's a real um, danger zone there too because they really need to get rehydrated um, and you need to get the medication into them. And at that point, you would need to reassess your management plan and look for some higher needs environment, such as, you know, getting them to hospital or calling an ambulance or, or, or getting them to an emergency department. Um, okay, Lily, next slide, please. Um, we're really lucky here at Windana. Um, and like I said, we sort of tend to take the low edge of, um, of the users, but um, we're really lucky to have naturopaths on staff who um, who really have got um, a quite a lot of tools in their in their toolbox for um, treating the symptoms and the just the associated sort of health stuff that goes along with with heavy GHB use. They use some magnesium and calcium for anxiety, agitation, sleep, and pain. They use NAC, I won't even pronounce that, I always stumble over that word. Um, NAC, you'll see it, you can get it at health food shops. It, it, it works at the neurotransmitter um, recovery sort of space, works a bit with cravings, which is you know, really good. And it um, works with your cognitive function um, to improve you know, uh, re, um, your return of good cognitive function. Um, we have this wonderful thing called anxiety mix, which, um, which apparently tastes awful and it's got those um, those uh, roots and things there that I won't say again um, but people love it and it's really it really works well and I see clients buy it all the time when they discharge they can buy the bottles and take home along with the anxiety mix we've got the thing called a cannabis mix and likewise um, you know although they sort of they grimace when they take it they say oh it tastes awful but it really um, really helps them uh, quite a lot um, vitamin b vitamin c zinc fish oil they're all thrown in for you know improvement in immunity appetite and skin and of course they focus quite heavily on hydration and nutrition um, at windana making um making the you know it's a really healthy diet there's no sugar there's no caffeine all that kind of stuff so um yeah, that's, uh, that's the naturopathic contribution. Now, I just threw in this case study just to sort of, I suppose, highlight what are the issues uh, in this space for withdrawal units and, um, and, and um, this, so I'll take you through. So we had a 29 year old woman, uh, she was using ice and GHB and cannabis. Um, less than four months dependent, you know, regular dependent use. Um, she had no comorbidities, no GABA related dependence. So what I mean by that, she wasn't using it with alcohol. She wasn't using it with benzos. So we had sort of no indication to think that she would need quite a high dose of benzos to get her through uh, the withdrawing from this less than 20 mils a day that she reported. Um, she was using it in two to three mil increments throughout the day, and that should have been the alarm bell for us, perhaps, but, um, but it wasn't. Um, but, you know, it was such a small amount, it didn't sort of add up um, to more than 20 mils per day. Um, we admitted her, dosed her with 15 milligrams a day as PAM at four, then another 15 at eight. By, by nine o'clock, she was sort of, you know, not really settling. By 9.30, she really, she just she got quite confused. She was sweaty. She had a mild tremor and she was starting to become, you know, delusional. Um, and we recognised that, you know, this was beyond the scope of our environment to manage. Um, so we uh, called an ambulance. They were really good. They came in. She was taken to hospital and um, dosed with 80 milligrams of diazepam and managed there for a few days. Um, 
unfortunately, while she was in hospital, she had a fall, hit her head, which is, um, you know, another issue that, you know, the, and it's about the environment, you know, where is the best place to manage people um, in GHB withdrawal, you know, sometimes the hospital um, isn't well set up for that. And I'll talk a bit more about that on the next slide, but she discharged herself from hospital on day five, although the plan was that she was returning to us. So if finally, um, you know, just, I think it's worth just raising that, you know, there are these issues for withdrawal units and also for clients in choosing where they, they are best to go. Um, we all want safety for the client. We all want staff to not be stressed about not being able to manage people um, uh, in the way that, you know, that is ideal. And we want, you know, clients to have a good experience and, and we want the health system to, you know, be um, working well as well. Um, it, we're all working in the absence of really clearly prescribed guidelines for assessing the severity of withdrawal. As I said, we're, there's no randomised controlled trials. We're really kind of, you know, we've got four mils, 30 mils, and we're picking sort of, you know, zones in the middle and saying, oh, well, maybe that one should go to, you know, a hospital bed. This one we could manage in a home base. This one maybe we could manage at another detox. Um, under reporting of use, that's a that's a big issue. Like um, what what happens is you know the word on the street, or you can go to Windana if you're using less than X, and you know um, people or people will choose what place they want to go to more because of the environment or for other reasons rather than um, rather than that's the best place. And sometimes they'll underreport their use um, so that they get in. So quite often day two or, th you know, day one, even people sort of say, oh, actually I was using 30 mils, um, I, I told a lie. Um, the next thing is the details in the assessments. Um, look, the assessments, they're a wonderful, huge document with heaps of information, um, but sometimes those, those critical little bits of information that we need to make the right decision isn't there. So, you know, um, it'll say they're using this much a day, but it won't say um, how often they're using it or how long they've been using it at that level four. They might have first used it at 16, but they've been using it 24 hours a day for three weeks. Like that little bit may not be in the assessment or by the time the assessment gets to the detox unit, things have changed so much. Um, you know, we keep needing to reassess and re-validate uh, that little bit of information. Um, managing the adverse events, withdrawal units like ours and, and even others, even that are closely located to hospitals, they're often, it's difficult to respond. Acute health isn't well set up as we saw with our woman. They're not well set up to manage people who may be in delirium. It happens really rapidly. It really requires someone mm -hmm. coming in, dosing someone really quickly. And then someone being able to special that person in an environment so they don't fall over. So they are looked after. Hospitals will have a, a room they could put someone in, um, like a safety room, but that might be full with someone else. So, um, and I guess the final thing is, you know, we just all want everyone to have a good experience. Um, so, yeah. And finally, Lily, did you, I had some references there. There you go. So there's some references if you want to do some more reading. Um, yeah, thanks. The take home message, just the amount, really assess that well. Thanks, Sandra. That was that was wonderful. That was a that was a great tour. Um, I uh, we'll we'll get you back at the at the um, end because we hopefully we'll have we'll have a few minutes. Uh, I now would uh, would like to introduce uh, Marla Rems from uh, formerly from Harm Reduction Victoria Dance Wise. Uh, Marla is is joining joining us from uh the netherlands and am i right that it's like midnight um where you are Mala? i think it's it's actually quite yeah nice. that's true hi everyone Thanks so um it is uh we're very grateful that uh that you are joining joining us uh to share your your experience 
Um, what just to, just to say, Marla um, has had eight years of experience as a registered nurse in clinical consultative um, psychiatry before uh, returning back to the to the Netherlands. And you've worked with Dancewise for a few years, I understand. And you're going to be discussing issues around stigma and and sort of filling in some of the other um, gaps, I guess, that we that we have in regard to to uh, to, to this topic of uh, GHB. So thanks, Marla. Okay, thank you. Um, so the first thing uh, I wanted to talk about was indeed uh, stigmatization of uh, GHB use. And this is a model that uh, came out in 2017, uh, which I thought was really useful. So in the center, you can see a uh, public stigma, uh, which is defined as a public endorsement of prejudice and discriminations towards minority groups. So this is often just because of uh, uh, the way uh, GHB overdose presented. Uh, people find it really discomfortable uh, to look at and therefore, um, yeah, people might, might have certain ideas about people using GHB. And this uh, then can lead to self-stigma. So uh, self-stigma means that the person in the minority group internalizes the public stereotypes or prejudice and apply the, applies them to uh, his or her life. Um, so in this case, uh, that would mean that um, someone may uh, feel that they're not able to talk about their GHB use. So this could be in an acute situation where someone has used GHB and they're uh, uh, looking uh, for help and they uh, wouldn't feel comfortable to actually express that towards others that they have used GHB but also in the long term, if they uh, get into trouble uh, with their GHB use, uh, that they might not ask for a professional help to taper down on their GHB use. Um, the structural stigma is uh, the public and private sectors policies that unintentionally restrict opportunities for the minority group. So this relates, uh, for instance, to um, uh, clubs that uh, ban uh, GHB use from uh, their uh, premises uh, by stating that if someone's caught uh, with using GHB, they maybe have a, a life, lifetime ban from that uh, venue. Um, and this feeds again into the public stigma and the self stigma. The courtesy stigma is a stigma experienced by those who are in close contact with the stigmatized group. So this either could be uh, you as health, health uh, workers, could be friends or family. Um, and as you can see, uh, these all influence each other. So I, th I always think this is a useful, useful model. Uh, if you'd like to know more, it's uh, described in the book, The Stigma of Mental Illness, End of the Story, uh, published in 2017. Okay, next slide. So the second part I wanted to talk about is GHB uh, use and uh, drug combinations. Um, and I just wanted to present some data on this, uh, which is from a, a major study here from the Netherlands uh, in which uh, we monitored over uh, well over 3 million uh, festival attendees and see what uh, health uh, disturbances occurred. And uh, by um, no, uh, writing down all the different uh, presentations, we were managed to uh, to calculate the relative risk compared to people who didn't use drugs on sites. Um, and as you can see, with the single use, you can see that cannabis, ecstasy, and alcohol use leads to a one to two times higher chance of uh, needing professional uh, medical help. With amphetamine use, that's uh, two to six times. Uh, um, the times the risk uh, compared to someone who didn't use drugs. Note that this is amphetamine use, not methamphetamine use, because we don't really have uh, methamphetamine use. It's not prevalent here in, in the Netherlands. Uh, cocaine is uh, 1 to 13 times uh, the chance of presenting, uh, needing uh, medical help. Uh, GHB, as you can see, has the highest risk. Uh, which is 17 to 27 times. 
And if you combine that with alcohol, it leads even to a 26 to 28 times uh, the chance of needing professional help. And uh, ecstasy and GHB leads to 25 to 30 times the uh, chance of needing professional help. With ecstasy and GHB combined, we've also noticed that if someone loses consciousness, uh, the, the, the endurance of the coma, so the time the, the uh, uh, state of coma is, uh, is present, uh, is also increased. And then lastly, um, about GHB with uh, amphetamine use, um, there is this urban myth that if someone's overdosed on GHB, you see, should give them amphetamine. I've actually seen people <laughs> trying to stuff uh, some powder in an unconscious person's nose, hoping they would wake up, which is not a good idea. Um, so uh, two major is issues occur with this. And the first of it uh, is that the amphetamines may uh, decrease some of the muscle, uh, uh, may increase some of the mu muscle tension. So people would physically be awake, but mentally they would still have a loss of consciousness. Um, so you would see uh, someone not knowing what they're doing, but being still quite active, uh, which just makes it a lot more challenging to manage. And the second thing is that there's a difference in, effect, in the effective duration. So GHB effectively, uh, the effects last between one to three hours um, and amphetamines uh, somewhere between six and 12 hours. And as GHB wears off, it has slightly stimulating effects. So someone might uh, come from actually being unconscious to a state of being stimulated from the GHB wearing off plus uh, the stimulation from the amphetamine use and the rapid uh, shift in consciousness may pose a greater risk. So just in general, it's just a really bad idea to combine a GHB and we see a massive, a massive increase of risks. Okay, thank you. Stephen? I'm back. I'm back. Uh, thank you for that. Marla, that was that's great. And um Marla will bring you will bring you back in a in a moment um with the with the other with the other speakers. But um now I would just I would like to introduce to you all uh, Simon Brisbane. Uh Simon uh works um, works in a couple of places in Victoria and has um, has a lot of experience in regard to harm reduction. He is a harm reduction and overdose prevention program um, manager and for Uniting in Ballarat. And Simon has over 30 years experience as a registered nurse working in a number of areas. And Simon, uh, thanks for, for, for today, uh, for agreeing to come and, and talk to us about um, experiences really from the front line and what you've, what you're, uh, what you've seen. Um, so thanks, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks Stephen and thanks Celia. It's been a great presentation so far, all the speakers. Um, I would concur with everything that the speakers have uh, also said. So I just wanted to give a quick uh, rundown on what I'm finding working with clients uh, in a regional Victoria setting. The GHB has remained available throughout the whole of COVID particularly. Um, it is certainly something that I've had clients, the youngest is 14 years of age using uh, GHB right up to the mid to late 50s and these are people who are pretty much using lots of other drugs as well. I don't see any clients who are just using GHB on its own. Um, all of them have experienced some adverse events from blowouts through to waking up unconscious in unknown environments, um, ending up in hospital, theft of belongings. Uh, so that's a really common thing as well. The price for the GHB remains, um, I guess, compared to other things, very competitive. It's $25 or thereabouts for a five mil bottle. Um, 
and there's certainly no trouble in people accessing that as well. The other thing that I find that my clients tell me as well and that you see when you're working with people is that they have a very rapid tolerance development. So people can go from starting out using GHB to having a couple of doses in a day, then a couple of doses the next day, and they need to uh, constantly increase that dose so that they get the desired effects. Um, and as the other speakers have said, you know, that tolerance develops quickly. And in my experience with clients, the people that are using daily increasing amounts for probably that two week mark seems to be the time that that sort of dependence starts to kick in. Um, the adverse events we've sort of already spoken about and the age of people using. The other thing that um, is a very important thing to know, and Lily did touch on it earlier in her presentation, is that the duration of the desirable effects of GHB are much, much shorter than the adverse effects of GHB. So Lily um, covered it well in her presentation, but it's important, you know, as harm reduction information for people that it's explained to them that, you know, redosing, even though the desired effects, the, you know, the feelings of euphoria and you know, relaxation, et cetera, have worn off, the, the drug is still in your system. And as Lily mentioned, it's very important about timing of redosing. Uh, I generally suggest to people a minimum of two hours, preferably three, but um, you know, that case that Lily mentioned with the glass of wine the next day or another drug the next day, particularly pills, um, then you, know, you can run into trouble. Um, some quick harm reduction information that I pass on to clients is that measuring is that Lily's already pointed out, it's very precise. The difference between a good time and a bad time is really minimal. Um, using a syringe barrel is definitely the way to go. There are issues with that though, because the actual liquid is quite, um, I want to say corrosive, but I don't think that's the right word, but it strips off the markings on syringes. So putting some clear um, sellotape around the barrel of the syringe before you start is a good idea, but preferably you would have a new barrel for every dose, that would be even better. Um, obviously dosing as to the 0.1 mil is difficult if you're already a little intoxicated. Um, and unfortunately, GHB is not something that you can say, okay, I'm gonna have six doses over this night time. Let's draw up six barrels and have them sort of ready. You can't do that because the actual substance is a little bit corrosive on the uh, rubber plunger in the barrel as well. So dosing is really challenging. Lily mentioned the writing the timing on your arm or using your phone, excellent way to go. And also too, so that if you are found unconscious or a client's found unconscious, then someone can see um, how much you've had and when was the last dose. Not using alone, um, like you know, harm reduction for any drug, GHB in particular, because it does have such a small window between what's desirable and what's undesirable. Um, and always remind people that calling emergency responses, ambulances, is you know it's the way to go and putting someone into the recovery position if they do have a blowout um, and there's other harm reduction information but i think the other speakers have already mentioned most of it and it's also been in the chat throughout as well so that's pretty much all i have to add Okay, I'm back and I do, Simon, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And I think the other speakers are gonna be popping back any second here they come, they're gonna be, they're gonna be um, coming back, great. Look, um, the slides 
will be made available on the website. And uh, so, sorry, I should have said that at the beginning because there's been quite a few, um, quite a few requests that have been coming through. So yes, they will be the slides and we've also got the recording. So it's, um, it will be there. And, um, and the other thing too, I've noticed with the, the chat, uh, the questions that have answered and that have been asked and then the, and the answers and um, that have, have come have been really quite, I think really informative and really helpful. And I think we need to be scooping those up and getting those out there because it's been a good discussion and people reinforcing comments, et cetera. Um, so, so that will be there. So um, everyone's, everyone is, is here. Um, thank you all. And look, there's, I mean, the, a lot of the questions that have been asked have been answered actually in the, the chat. And I've, I've noticed some um, people like Samantha um, from Harm Reduction Victoria has, has been great at um, popping in some comments too. So thanks, thanks Sam for that. Um, whoa, there's a really big question that's just popped up just then. Um, now, I can I just, everyone's yes. off of mute, aren't they? So we can all, we can all hear you. Maybe I'll just start by, is there any, is there anything that you think um, from your experience as each of the speakers that we have not discussed? And is there something uh, that is, that is hanging at the moment? I mean, we have, we have been asked um, a question around what makes uh, withdrawal fatal. Um, and I'm not sure whether that particularly has been, has been answered, but a lot of the other questions have been. Um, and I don't know, um, Sandra, did you, do you want to? Well, I guess, I, you know, I think she said, what is it, the seizures? And I'd say that that is the biggest risk people going in a kind of status epilepticus type, whatever, you know, situation going to ICU. People, you know, um, if you can't get on top of the autonomic sort of, you know, nervous system, if you can't kind of dampen down the reactivity that, you know, you know, you, someone may end up in ICU um, under heavy sedation um, till they can kind of reset that whole um, body processes. Um, you know, yes, yeah, seizures and unmanaged seizures are, are really um, probably the biggest risk. Um, you know, delirium being the other thing and, and the misadventure that happens to people if they're unmanaged in their delirium and um, the medical issues that can happen there. Is that um, yeah, yeah. Simon might, um, he's, you know, probably seen this, you know, similar over the years as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. It's very much the, it's very much like similar dangers to alcohol withdrawal in that seizures are the main problem. You can have the prolonged seizures, which obviously cause, you know, significant brain injury if they're not managed correctly. And um, sometimes, as Sandra also mentioned, the requirement for large doses of diazepam um, is not always, you know, achievable in a community sort of base setting. It's better done where there is that instant access to medical supervision in case, you know, that diazepam does, yeah, become a high requirement. Can I, um, on top of that, the length of, of, uh, of detox what, what are we talking about um the time is that is that too difficult to put a um a number on that the, yeah, the just sort of says that um you know like um it, it people go into withdrawal quickly and then withdrawal symptoms can exist for you know up to sort of two weeks you know generally um so yeah that's i mean and obviously everyone's different and the other complicating factor is very rarely people come to withdraw for one drug we're dealing with multiple drugs um, in most presentations so we're dealing with withdrawal from ice as well as the ghb or you know alcohol and ghb so um and you know other health issues that um you know have resulted from the, the drug use. So, um, yeah. Um, well, a, a question here, could you tell me more about this delay delirium and, and are people in, um, and are people in ED? Um, is a seven day detox still the recommendation for withdrawal from high GHB use um, for those who well, are? 
I mean, your best tool is using your scale to measure, like, okay, what symptoms? So on day six, you know, you know, are they still having the symptoms? So you know, using your tools to measure what are the symptoms a person's having. Um, you know, they're not unlikely to go into delirium at day seven if they're not having a whole range of other symptoms as well. Um, you know, that's. Um, it's, it's observation monitoring, um, just not sort of dosing someone up and then, you know, letting them go. I mean, you need to kind of, it's, it's a presentation that needs to be observed and monitored. Um, whether that be in a community withdrawal space or, or a hospital or, or, or whatever. But it's really just that first couple of, you know, those first few hours, first couple of days where the most um, issues are going to arise as far as I'm, you know, in my okay, experience, okay. I would say that. One, one question that's just popped up at the end here is um, commenting on the high amounts um, and the, the, is there, is there any risk of damage to your mouth, throat or stomach if, if using it, it, it undiluted? Is there any? Yeah, there any maybe I can have, have a little comment about that. I do have clients that do uh, consume it undiluted and they follow it with a chaser straight away of um, Coke or something like that, soft drink type thing. Um, predominantly, though, people do dilute it into a juice. Uh, there was also some comments in there before about the taste of the different sort of 1,4-B versus GBL, GHB, and the the 1,4-B and um, GBL do taste a lot more chemical um, sort of, flavor if you want I guess um, than GHB but we also know from you know Victoria police stuff that most of what they see in Victoria is not GHB it's the other analogs um, that you know so I don't think anyone's really getting GHB uh, even though it's sold as that but definitely there is potential to if you know hold it in your mouth for too long before you swallow it and yeah, definitely undiluted is probably not the recommended way to do it safely. I've got a comment from a, from purely a lived experience point of view, and this is speaking to my friend who used daily. Um, he said long-term users, daily users, it's hard to, for your gut health, to use GBL. It's one form um butanidal is more um, for him he found that that was easier on his um, on his stomach and throat and mouth and things like that that he was constantly using what um, this might be back I'm not sure that uh, Marla um, would probably have a comment on this as well as Simon or well, all of you actually um, what are we seeing in regard to what are the high doses what what are, What's being reported on this sort of uh, you're seeing? So what what's the highest that we're starting to see of, of dosing? Um, the, I, uh, oh, you go, Oh no, sorry. Like I'm I'm happy to uh, talk about uh, what we see in the Netherlands, but uh, we mostly see GHB. So this is a major difference with uh, Australia because the doses of GHB are slightly different from one for B and GBL as GBL is uh, more potent uh, because it's converted more effectively, uh, metabolized more effectively. So a lower dose will cause a higher uh, blood, uh, blood level of GHB. So um, I, I think it pro it's probably more helpful just to ask uh, the other uh, people of the panel, what you see? Yeah, Simon, do you, do you want to comment? Yeah, so um, I hear stories of people using up to hundreds of mils a day, um, 200 mils. Um, I certainly have clients that I work with that take um, 10 to 20 mils per dose. Um, and uh, even, mm -hmm. yeah, so... And it escalates quickly. It goes from, you know, small doses up to a lot quite quite quickly. Um, so I don't know what the maximum that I've sort of clients, probably 150 mils a day. 
um, sort of five or six, 10, 15 mil doses. Um, but certainly, yeah, I've heard stories um, from clients of other people using up to 200 mils a day. Um, but, you know, I see in the chat, there's people that have hit, heard even more than that. So, um, yeah. Sandra, are you, um, did you want to add anything? Oh, anyone using that amount would, um, would we, yeah, we just could not manage them at all. And I would say, you know, if they yeah, definitely need hospitalisation um, and I'd be concerned that, you know, what's going on in their body um, and just, you know, if their supply was, was um, cut off or, you know, just, um, yeah, they're just, that's very risky, very mm -hmm. um, I've just noticed that Sam um, has just said, you know, are people getting it confused, um, getting mills confused with lines on syringes? Um, because it does, yeah. it does it have a, a, you know, a huge amount. Um, yeah, yeah. Look, I, um, it's, it, it is, it's 10 past um, the hour and we, um, we, were, we were aiming for the, the one hour. And we were, I guess we were being a little ambitious with the number of speakers. And look, it's... it's I think it's been a really informative um, presentations discussion, and uh, I want to uh, thank each of you uh, for for um, putting your presentations together and spending some time thinking, you know, more about them and have, how to get this across to everyone. And I, I really do appreciate it, and thank you, thank you for for your time, and um, yeah, you're, you're considered you're considered insights too. It's been really uh, it's been really appreciated, and yeah, and I think that's shown by just the number of people that have joined us today. Uh, so, on behalf of everyone, I do I do thank each of you um, for 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 this today. As I said, we will be um, putting this up on on the the, the uh, on our website. Uh, can I please um, just remind people that there is just a very short. Um, survey if you don't mind just um we're going to email that out to people as well they'll just take a couple of minutes just to give us a bit of feedback uh and i would like to say thanks thanks everyone uh for for joining us today um and i wish you all i wish you all the, the very best and um for for a break perhaps over the um the end of the year period and um let's um let's hope the next year is a, a better one hey so thanks, thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.